My name is Brad Nelson. I'm the Minister for Youth, and I'm here to introduce John. And I know most of you don't need to hear an introduction of John Piper. You know that he graduated from Wheaton College, from Fuller Seminary, and then from the University of Munich. He's written numerous books, Love Your Neighbors, um, The Justification of God, Desiring God. He and Wayne Grudem are editing a book right now on recovering biblical manhood and womanhood that should be out this summer. You know that he's married to Noel and has four sons, Carson, Abraham, Benjamin, and Barnabas, two of whom are in my, two of whom are in my youth group, and they're just a joy to minister with, minister to. They are really great kids. Um, John's done a great job in fathering them. John is the type of person, the type of communicator, that whenever he writes an article or writes a book or preaches a sermon or does a teaching or just reflects on a person or an event or a book, I come away inspired. I come away encouraged. I come away challenged in many different ways, challenged in how I'm living, challenged in how I'm thinking about something, Oftentimes I'm humbled or I have to fall before the Lord. But almost always I have a greater thirst for God. Almost always I am encouraged and so desirous to go hard after God. And so it's with that desire that I invite John up to share with us on his reflections from the life and ministry of David Brainerd. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works vindication and justice to all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor requite us according to our Iniquities, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Father, David Brainerd was just dust. What dust he was. And you have encouraged me so much through what you did with this dust. I want you, Lord God, to come and sustain the dust in this room. Breathe life into the dust in this room. Awaken and make ministries who persevere out of the dust in this room. Through Christ I pray. Amen. David Brainerd. I wish everybody had the opportunity to uh, spend a week or two just immersed in the 18th century in the journals and diaries of David Brainerd. Some people couldn't stand it, and others of us simply find glory everywhere. He was born in 1718 in Haddam, Connecticut. 
John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards were 14 years old when he was born. He was to see both waves of the Great Awakening firsthand in the, in the mid-30s and early 40s of the 1700s and then die at the age of 29 in 1747 in the house of Jonathan Edwards. His father was named Hezekiah, and he died when he was nine years old, when Brainerd, David Brainerd was nine years old. And I've reflected on that because I've had uh, three sons now, and Lord willing, we'll have a fourth who turned nine. And of all the ages I would choose not to die on my boys, it would be nine. Because at nine, they cling and love and need so bad. But he lost his father when he was nine. He lost his mother when he was 14. And then he went to visit or live with his 18-year-old sister who married in a nearby town. On top of an austere father and uh, losing his father and mother, he inherited probably a constitutional disposition towards depression. Uh, a man named Thomas Brainerd, writing 100 years later, 1865, wrote, about his family, in the whole Brainerd family for 200 years, there has been a tendency to morbid depression, akin to hypochondria. He wrote when he was young, I think it was just before his conversion, about this issue in his youth. He says, I was, I think, from my youth, something sober and inclined rather to melancholy than the other extreme, which is an understatement, I think. You all know that melancholy is the old-fashioned word for depression. He moved in with his sister then when he was 14 and lived with her for five years and wrestled with God. He hated the doctrine of original sin. He hated the divine law in its strictness. He hated the sovereignty of God, and he wrestled and wrestled he was, however, very punctilious in his religious efforts to break through. He read the Bible through twice a year as a rule while he was in that house with his sister Jerusha. Interesting name correlation there between the woman he will probably fall in love with. But he, he wasn't converted. He was very, very legalistic, he said. But then the day came, and let me read you the account of his conversion. And if you understood this account, you would understand his theology. It is Edward's theology. They write almost the same when it comes to salvation and the nature of true and saving faith. As I was walking in a dark, thick grove, he's 21 years old now, unspeakable glory seemed to open to the view and apprehension in my soul. It was a new inward apprehension or view that I had of God, such as I never had before, nor anything that I had the least remembrance of, so that I stood still and wondered and admired. My soul was so captivated and delighted with the excellency, the loveliness, and the greatness, and the other perfections of God, that I was swallowed up in Him, at least to that degree that I had no thought, as I remember at first, about my own salvation, or scarce that there ever was such a creature as I. And thus, the Lord, I trust. <laughs> Notice the diffidence with which these old fellows spoke about their own standing. And thus, the Lord, I trust, brought me to a hearty desire to exalt him, to set him on the throne, and to seek first his kingdom that is, principally and ultimately, to aim at his honor and glory as the king and sovereign of the universe, which is the foundation of the religion of Jesus. I felt myself in a new world. Lord's Day, July 12, 1739. He was 21 years old. A few months later, he entered Yale and... Uh, the hardships in those first years were terrible. He had to be sent home the first year because he began to cough up blood. So he already had, in 1739, the disease of which he would die eight years later, tuberculosis. The students were carnal. 
There was immense disinterest in spiritual things that year. He went home with measles again. It was an awful thing in those days. And when he came back in November of 1740, his second year, everything was different because George Whitfield had been there and had preached, and there was a great moving now among the students. Spiritual awakening was happening, and there was a division among the faculty who were not following along with what they would have called enthusiasm, but which Brainerd discerned to be genuine awakening. And the fans were flamed by Gilbert Tennant and Ebenezer Pemberton and James Davenport as they came through the college and fired the students up and created tremendous problems for the faculty and the, the staff. The way they decided to deal with these problems in the fall of 1741 was to call Jonathan Edwards to come preach a sermon at the graduation ceremony to straighten out the students and save the faculty from these enthusiasts. And Edwards preached a message. Brainerd was in the audience. The message is called The Distinguishing Marks of the Work of the Spirit of God. And he totally disappointed the faculty and the uh, powers that be because he argued that this awakening was a real work of God. No matter how many excesses, no, how many, no matter how many weird things were happening, it was real. Now, to understand the poignancy of this moment, you have to understand that on the morning of this address, the trustees gathered together of Yale College and passed a resolution that read like this. If any student of this college shall directly or indirectly say that the rector, either of the trustees or the tutors, are hypocrites, carnal, or unconverted men, he shall, for the first offense, make public confession in the hall, and for the second offense, be expelled. Now, you keep those words in mind, and you hear Edwards preaching, and he comes to the conclusion of his message and says this. It is no evidence that a work is not the work of God if many that are subjects of it are guilty of so great frowardness as to censure others as being unconverted. It was a direct attack on the trustees. And one can't help but wonder, with Brainerd sitting in the audience, whether Edwards felt some responsibility for what happened the next term. Brainerd came to chapel, and uh, one of the faculty members, one of the tutors named Chauncey Whittlesley, prayed in what was called a most pathetical manner, which I think means full of excessive pathos. And the hall cleared. Three people were left with Brainerd. A freshman was walking by the door. One of the students said to Brainerd, what did you think of uh, Whittlesley's prayer? And he said, I think Whis- Whittlesley has no more grace than a chair. And it was also reported that he said he wondered why the rector did not drop down dead for fining students for their evangelical enthusiasm. And Brainerd was summarily expelled. And it broke his heart. He could never get back in. He tried again and again to get back in. He rode miles through the wilderness, even after he'd become a missionary, to plead with the officers to give him another chance. He apologized profusely, and they never let him back in. Now, I'm moved to reflect at this moment on the sovereignty and providence of God. Because had this not happened, This man with tuberculosis would have finished Yale and taken a pastorate. That was his settled purpose. And he would have died and nobody would have heard of David. No impact upon the missionary movement would have happened. He was cut off in the middle of his dream. Because you see... A law had just been passed in Connecticut that said no established minister may be installed in Connecticut who has not graduated from Harvard, Yale, or a European college. And so he was undone as far as he was concerned. 
And there's a tremendous lesson here, namely that God, for His glory and for the good of His church, works through those moments when the best intentions of His servants are dashed. And Brainerd couldn't know it, and I think hopefully came to see it before the end of his life, that this careless word, I've thought about it with people like Johnny Erickson, one dive on one Sunday afternoon, a sudden moment, and everything changes. Manila was different. Twelve years later, as she led 4,000 of us in song, lifting her hands like this, ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap, ye lame, for joy. So there's a great lesson here. In fact, I'm tempted to speculate that the modern missionary movement wouldn't have happened if Brainerd hadn't been expelled from Yale University. That's speculation. November 25th, 1742 now, after a summer of agony, he is examined for his fitness to the missionary service. I won't go through the long process that drug him that direction, but one very dear friend, Jonathan Dickinson, who was a part of the commissioners for the Society of Scotland for Propagating Christian Knowledge, said, you should be a missionary to the Indians. I will pray about it. And he prayed and he was commissioned. So he went to Countameek, which was a little village just north of Stockton where Brain oh, Edwards was going to become a missionary to the Indians in a few years after he got kicked out of his church. And in April 1st, 1743, he began his year of preaching among the Indians in Countameek. He lasted one year there, although he learned the language in that year, translated some of the Psalms into the Indian language, and started a school, left it behind, and the Indians came down and were ministered to by a sergeant there in, in Stockbridge. His second assignment was to the Forks of the Delaware, a little um, northeast of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And uh, at the end of a month there, he rode down to New York and was ordained by the New Jersey Presbytery. The New York and the New Jersey Presbytery were on his side and on the side of the students and the Great Awakening against Yale. And we're going to hear the implications of that for the founding of a new school when we're done and, and Brainerd's role in that. So he was ordained in 1744. Yeah. He's going to die, keep in mind, in 47. He preached to the Indians then at the Forks of the Delaware for a year gathering a few of God's people, and then he was assigned to Cross Weeksel in New Jersey. And he went there, and there is where the great blessing came. God poured out the Holy Spirit on the Indians in Cross Weeksel, New Jersey, in an incredible way. And within a year, he had about 130 solid believers. He described, you know, I could give a whole talk on the way God came upon the Indians through the weight of truth, as David Brainerd kept discussing it. The weight of truth came upon them and they'd fall off their seats and weep for hours seeking rest and peace for their consciences. So God did a mighty work through, these, through Brainerd among these Indians. He moved them from Cross Weeksen in May of 1746 up to Cranbury. And there they built a little village and got land for the Indians so that they could have their own little reservation-like and their own church building. And he had a little hut there. And then his sickness got so bad that he spent four months in Elizabethtown with uh, Jonathan Dickinson. And then on uh, March 20th, 1747, he said his last farewell to the Indians, went up to Jonathan Edwards' house, there's not much evidence to go on, but almost everybody agrees he was in love with Jerusha, his 17-year-old daughter, Edward's 17-year-old daughter. She nursed him for the last 19 weeks of his life, and he died in Jonathan Edwards' house, October 9, 1747. A short life, 29 years, 5 months, and 19 days. Eight years a believer, four years a minister, a missionary. 
Why then was Brainerd's life so powerful? Why has it made the impact that it has? Of course, practically the first reason is that Jonathan Edwards was overwhelmed with this man's piety as he met him and lived with him for 19 weeks. And he took the diaries and wrote The Life of Brainerd. That book has been the most republished book of Edwards. The book has never been out of print. To my knowledge, it has exerted an absolutely enormous impact upon the modern missionary movement. Why did John Wesley say, let every preacher read carefully over the life of David Brainerd? Why was it written of Henry Martin? Perusing the life of David Brainerd, his soul was filled with a holy emulation of that extraordinary man, and after deep consideration and fervent prayer, he was at length fixed in a resolution to imitate his example, which has a sweet irony about it because he died almost at the same age and of the same disease and pain. Why did William Carey regard Edward's life of Brainerd as a sacred text and have it with him along with sermons of Edwards in India? Why did Robert Morrison and Robert McChain of Scotland and John Mills of America and Frederick Schwartz of Germany and David Livingston of England and Andrew Murray of South Africa and Jim Elliott of modern America, all of them count Jonathan, I mean David Brainerd, a teacher and model and stand in awe of him and find inspiration from him. Gideon Hawley was another missionary that went out inspired by Jonathan Edwards, and he wrote about the struggles that he had in the wilderness of New England. I indeed greatly need something more than human to support me. I read my Bible and Mr. Brainerd's life, the only books I brought with me, and from them I have a little support. Now, why? Why did this life have this extraordinary impact? Well, let me ask a more manageable question. Why has it had an impact on me? And then maybe, maybe it will transfer to these others. Why? The answer, in summary form, I think is that Brainerd's life is a vivid, powerful testimony to the truth that God can and does use weak, sick, discouraged, beat down, lonely, struggling saints who cry to him day and night to accomplish amazing things for his glory. And so what I want to do now in the time we have is to talk about the struggles that he had, seven of them, the, the way he pressed on in these struggles, and thirdly, the effect of his life. First in, his struggles. Number one, Brainerd struggled with almost constant sickness. He had to drop out of college, as I said several times. He began to cough up blood in 1740. In 1744, he wrote, rode several hours in the rain through the howling wilderness, although I was so disordered in body that little or nothing but blood came from me. He would write things like this again and again. In the afternoon, my pain increased exceedingly and was obliged to betake myself to bed, was sometimes almost bereaved of the exercise of my reason by the extremity of the pain. August 46. Having lain in the cold sweat all night, I coughed much bloody matter this morning and was under great disorder of body and not a little melancholy. May of 47, Jonathan Edwards' house. The doctor said, your disease is incurable. You will die of consumption in a matter of weeks or months. In the last couple of months of his life, his suffering was absolutely incredible. You know, there were no pills in those days. Nothing to relieve what we, re what we say must be relieved today. Nothing. September 24, this is a few weeks before he died. 
in the greatest distress that ever I endured, having an uncommon kind of hiccup which either strangled me or threw me into a straining to vomit. Edward's comments in the last week, He told me it was impossible for any to conceive of the distress he felt in his breast. He manifested much concern lest he should dishonor God by impatience under the extreme agony, which was such that he said the thought of enduring it one minute longer was almost insupportable. And just before he died, he said to those around him, It is another thing than people imagine to die. The thing that strikes you about the suffering of Brainerd is not simply the severity of it, but the consistency of it. He always suffered. From the time he was a student, he never had relief for any significant amount of time. It was a relentless sickness. And he pressed on in his work. Second, Brainerd struggled with relentlessly recurring depression. He came to understand this a little, I think. Uh, Edward said that at first he attributed far too much to spiritual desertion and far too little to the disease of melancholy. That's their phrase, the disease of of melancholy. And so his later judgments about what was happening in his blackest moods were a little more balanced than his earlier ones. But it was a horrendous thing, nevertheless. And this was his greatest torment, not the tuberculosis. Um, He did say that he detected a very profound difference in the melancholy after his conversion and the melancholy before his conversion as though a great rock had been inserted underneath his life so that he never despaired of the electing love of God after his conversion. A great gift to him in his darkest days. He would say repeatedly, Black, God is gone, but I do not doubt his love. Things like that. A few words of his own to give you a flavor of what he experienced Much of it was owing to his intense hatred for the remaining sin in his life. November 4, 42. "'Tis distressing to feel in my soul that hell of corruption which still remains in me." And his sense of unworthiness was so intense that it sometimes just paralyzed him. January 23, 43. "'Scarce ever felt myself so unfit to exist as now. I saw I was not worthy of a place among the Indians.' where I am going. None knows but those that feel it what the soul endures that is sensibly shut out from the presence of God. Alas, tis more bitter than death. In fact, again and again he compared it to death and I wrote down 22 places where he longed and pleaded that he would die. Would die. Sunday, February 3rd, 1745, my soul remembered the wormwood and the gall, I might almost say the hell of Friday night last. And I was greatly afraid I should be obliged again to drink of that cup of trembling, which was inconceivably more bitter than death, and made me long for the grave unspeakably more than for hidden treasure. Sunday, 44, December 16, was so overwhelmed with dejection that I knew not how to live. I longed for death exceedingly. My soul was sunk in deep waters and the floods were ready to drown me. I was so much oppressed that my soul was in a kind of horror. And what compounded this experience for Brainerd was that the depression began to infect and lame his devotional exercises and his ministry of preaching. March 9, 43, rode 16 miles to Montauk and had some inward sweetness on the road, but something of flatness and deadness after I came there and had seen the Indians, withdrew and endeavored to pray, but found myself 
awfully deserted and left. It was immobilized sometime in his distresses. September 46 was scarce ever more confounded with a sense of my own unfruitfulness and unfitness of my work than now. Oh, what a dead, heartless, barren, unprofitable wretch did I now see myself to be. My spirits were so low, my bodily strength so wasted that I could do nothing at all. At length, being much overdone, lay down on a buffalo skin and sweat much of the whole night. But Brainerd pressed on and did not quit. He never quit. Third, Brainerd struggled with loneliness. He tells of having to endure profane talk of strangers one night, April 43. Oh, I longed for some dear Christian who knew my distresses. A month later, he says, Most of the talk I hear is either Highland Scotch or Indian. I have no fellow Christian to whom I might unbosom myself and lay open my spiritual sorrows with whom I might take sweet counsel and conversation about the heavenly things and join in social prayer. In December 1745, he wrote a letter to Eliezer Wheelock. We'll come back to him in a minute. He founded another college under Brainerd's inspiration. He wrote, I doubt not by what by that time you have read my journal through, you'll be more sensible of the need I stand of a companion in travel than ever you were before. And I read uh, two nights ago this quote that we all can empathize with. I think about, he, he didn't want just anybody. A horse wouldn't do and a carnal Christian wouldn't do. He wanted a soul companion. He wrote, there are many with whom I can talk about religion, but alas, I find few with whom I can talk religion itself. But blessed be the Lord, there are some that love to feed on the kernel rather than the shell. He, uh, in his last 19 weeks, was nursed by Jerusha Edwards. She was 17, and uh, in all likelihood, it was a precious relationship. He speaks of a of an unparalleled precious acquaintance. Never names him or her, but uh, most people think that they did have a warm and spiritual relationship in those last days. Fourth, Brainerd struggled with immense external hardships as a missionary. In his first mission to Count Amik in 43, he said, I live poorly with regard to the comforts of life. Most of my diet consists of boiled corn, hasty pudding, etc. I lodge on a bundle of straw. My labor is hard and extremely difficult, and I have little experience of success to comfort me. In August of that year, he said, In this week, 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 W-E-A-K, in this week's state of body, I was not little distressed for want of suitable food, had no bread, nor could I get any. I am forced to go or send 10 or 15 miles for all the bread I eat, and sometimes it is moldy and sour before I eat it. If I get any considerable quantity, but through divine goodness, I had some Indian meal of which I made little cakes and fried them, yet felt contented with my circumstances and sweetly resigned to God. He was frequently lost in the woods. His horse, his car broke down again and again. His, his horse would get poisoned. His horse got a broken leg. His horse got stolen. All of our car experiences <laughs> happened to a missionary back then as well. With this lung condition, picture yourself now trying to be warmed in the winter in a hut with a fire. Again and again, the smoke would so fill the room, he, he would almost lose his breath. He would have to go outside in the cold. And he said, I would either be dying of cold outside or I would be smothering in the smoke inside. And he's alone totally alone, 15 miles from anybody in the wilderness with tuberculosis and smoke filling his house and 29 degrees outside or whatever. The struggle with external hardships was not the worst struggle, but it was an amazing one. And he 
resigned himself to it like this. Here's what he said. Such fatigues and hardships as they serve to wean me more from the earth, and I trust will make heaven sweeter. Formerly, when I was thus exposed to cold, rain, etc., I was ready to please myself with the thoughts of enjoying a comfortable house, a warm fire, and other outward comforts. But now, these have less place in my heart through the grace of God, and my eye is more to God for comfort. In this world, I expect tribulation, and it does not now as formerly appear a strange thing to me. I don't, in such seasons of difficulty, flatter myself that it will be better hereafter, but rather think how much worse it could be, how much greater trials others of God's children have endured, and how much greater are perhaps those reserved for me. Blessed be God that He makes or He is the comfort to me under my sharpest trials, and scarce ever let these thoughts be attended with terror or melancholy, but they are attended frequently with great joy. So in spite of the terrible external hardships, Brainerd pressed on and indeed often flourished at the moment when he suffered most. Fifth, Brainerd struggled with a bleak outlook on nature. A bleak outlook on nature. And we will forgive him for this quickly, I think, because it is hard to look at a rose when you're spitting blood. But it is a great tragedy that he did not have more of Jonathan Edwards' eyes. He never said one thing about the beauty of nature. Never once did he talk of a sunset, a sunrise, a bird, a bee, a flower. And he lived among them, always. Edwards, on the contrary, would take walks and horse rides in the woods. He would see the excellency of God everywhere, echoes of glory in everything from a spider's web to the sun. Brainerd had not one ounce of this appreciation for nature. It was a howling wilderness to him. Constant misery as far as he was concerned. And the the great tragedy of that is that um, the burden that he bore blinded him, it seemed, from the antidote to the burden. God has appointed nature as a healing means for our souls. Now, one of the ironies here, too, is that Edwards did not see this, as far as I can tell. Edwards complimented Brainerd for not having an imagination because it was imaginations that were wrecking the Great Awakening. You see, Enthusiasm, as it was called, excessive emotionalism, was rooted in imagining things that had no grace in them. And Edwards was just fighting and fighting against people who say, Oh, I saw the Lord. His arms were open wide to me. He was enfolding me in his arms. I am his child. And they lived like the devil. Edwards says, This is no true grace. Your visions are nothing. And so he he warmly congratulates Brainerd for having no warm imagination. All of Brainerd's thought was rooted in a spiritual apprehension of glory. Well, there is a plus and a minus to not having an imagination, I tell you. Far healthier would have been the counsel of Spurgeon. To sit long in one posture, poring over a book or driving a quill is in itself a taxing of nature. But add to this a badly ventilated chamber, a body which has been long without muscular exercise and a heart burdened with many cares, and we have all the elements for preparing a seething cauldron of despair. Especially in the dim months of fog, Nature outside his window is calling him to health and beckoning him to joy. 
He who forgets the humming of the bees among the heather, the cooing of the wood pigeons in the forest, the song of birds in the wood, the rippling of the rills among the rushes, the sighing of the wind among the pines, needs not wonder if his heart forgets to sing and his soul grows heavy. Nobody told him to open the eyes of his eyes. At least he didn't seem to hear or he didn't record if they did. But I I repeat, we will quickly forgive Brainerd because it is hard to see when you're suffering. It is hard. And yet, let us consider the lilies, brothers. It was not merely Spurgeon who set us on this quest to open our eyes. Consider the lilies. Sixth, Brainerd struggled to love the Indians. He struggled to love the Indians. If love is known by sacrifice, he loved them. If love is also known by heartfelt, warm affection and compassion, he struggled to love them. Felt some compassion for souls and mourned. I had no more. I feel much more kindness, meekness, gentleness, and love toward all mankind than ever. He really did get great success in this from time to time. Felt much sweetness and tenderness in prayer, especially my whole soul seemed to love my worst enemies and was enabled to pray for those that are strangers and enemies to God with great degree of softness and pathetic fervor. But at other times, he was empty of affection and compassion for souls. And he expresses his guilt for that, that he had no more ardency and so little desire for their salvation. Uh, 44, November 2nd, about noon, rode up to the Indians and while going could feel no desire for them and even dreaded to say anything to them. So Brainerd struggled with the rise and fall of love in his heart. He loved. He loved, but he longed to love more. I love them, Father. Help thou my unlove. And seventh, he struggled to stay true to his calling as a missionary. He struggled to stay true. Remember now, he was expelled from college, cut off from the pastoral ministry, bowed to what he believed was the call of God to missions after that breaking off of his pastoral journey, and then, surprisingly, was offered several pastorates along the way. Good ones, too. He was offered the church at Millington near his home in Haddam in 1744, and he turned it down and prayed that God would send forth laborers to the vineyard. And then he was offered the most lucrative parish in New York, Long Island, East Hampton. Jonathan Edwards says, it is the fairest, pleasantest town on the whole island and one of its largest and most wealthy parishes. That's a quote. And Brainerd wrote on Thursday, April 5th. Now, mark, mark this choice. Committed. Resolved to go on still with the Indian affair, if divine providence permitted, although before felt some inclination to go to East Hampton, where I was solicited to go. Now, mark, mark this choice. He's spitting blood almost every day. He is alone. He doesn't have adequate food or shelter. The Indians are often unresponsive. He is offered a parish, his lifelong dream, or his dream since he was converted. And he says no. There were a lot of other opportunities too. He wrote, I could have no freedom in the thought of any other circumstances or business in my life. All my desire was the conversion of the heathen, and all my hope was in God. 
God does not suffer me to please or comfort myself with hopes of seeing friends returning to my dear acquaintance. Who is that? And enjoying worldly comforts. He has, he has basically surrendered them. He probably knows he's a dying man. Well, those are the seven struggles that I wanted to mention. And now I want to turn to how he pressed on in these struggles. We began with introduction to his life, turned to the struggles, and now thirdly, to his pressing on. I personally think the reason that David Brainerd's life has exerted the power that it has is because in spite of his struggles, he never gave up. That's simple. He was consumed with a passion to finish his race, honor his master, spread the kingdom, and advance in holiness. Absolutely consumed. He could not relent from his pursuit of the kingdom, the honor of his master, and his own holiness. He had an unswerving allegiance to the cause of Christ so that I think we can all empathize with Henry Martin when, after reading him in Cambridge in 1802, he said, I long to be like him. Long to be like him. In spite of all the strangeness and unhealth and suffering, there is something in this man that makes us say, I must be like him. I want to be like him. Brainerd called this passion to finish his race and not turn back a pleasing pain. He said, when I really enjoy God, I feel my desires of Him the more insatiable and my thirstings after holiness the more unquenchable. Oh, for holiness. Oh, for more of God in my soul. Oh, this pleasing pain. It makes my soul press after God. Oh, that I might not loiter on my heavenly journey. Oh, that I might not loiter on my heavenly journey. He was utterly gripped by the apostolic admonition, redeem the time for the days are evil. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap if you do not faint. Abound in the work of the Lord. He is an outfleshing of the pursuit of those apostolic commands with incredible devotion and single-minded fervor. April 17, 47, his last year. Oh, I long to fill the remaining moments. All for God. Though my body was so feeble and wearied with preaching and much private conversation, yet I wanted to sit up all night to do something for God. To God, the giver of these refreshments, be glory forever and ever. Amen. February 21, 46. My soul was refreshed and comforted. I could not bless God. I could not but bless, bless God who had enabled me in some good measure to be faithful in the day past. Oh, how sweet it is to be spent and worn out for God. Among the means that Brainerd used in pursuing God in this way was prayer, fasting, study, and writing. Let me say a word about each of these. Prayer. What a man of prayer. Again and again you read, spent the day in prayer for the Indian. Or set aside six times today prayer, or met with nearby family or friend to pray with them for the concerns of the kingdom. He prayed for his holiness. He prayed for the conversion of the Indians. He prayed, perhaps above all, for the advancement of the kingdom. Oh, God, let your kingdom come in New England. He prayed and prayed that God's cause would advance. What a spirit of prayer this man had. He was visiting the home of a friend one time, and he, he just went off by himself often to pray. You seek out a little place, a room, or outside. And this is what he wrote. I continued wrestling with God in prayer 
for my dear little flock here, and more especially for the Indians elsewhere, as well as for dear friends in one place and another, till it was bedtime and I feared I should hinder the family, etc. But oh, with what reluctancy did I find myself obliged to consume time in sleep. <laughs> with what reluctancy I went to bed when I wanted to keep on praying. And he fasted and fasted and fasted. Again and again you read, fasted and prayed for the day. Fasted every time he needed guidance when he switched fields or those, that summer after he was kicked out of school. Fasting and fasting for guidance, for spiritual depth, for usefulness. And then he wrote a letter at the end of his life to young ministers urging them to build into your lives fasting and prayer because of the spiritual benefits he had received by it. Here's what Edwards wrote about this experience. Among all the many days he spent in secret fasting and prayer and that he gives account of in his diary, there is scarce an instance of one but what was either attended or soon followed with apparent success and a remarkable blessing in special incomes and consolations of God's Spirit and very often before the day was ended. In other words, Edward says as he documents it that almost every day that he fasted, something good happened in his life. Thirdly, besides prayer and fasting, here was, in a sense, a very frustrated scholar, which every pastor is almost. Every pastor wants more time to read, as far as I know. I've never met one who says, oh, I read too much. Or, I get too much time to read. Right. But Edward, um, Brainerd was an extraordinary mind. He was a genius, probably, in his language learning and his bent towards study. And he studied much. <laughs> Picture him studying. He built four little huts in his life. In each place where he worked, he built with his own hands a little, little hut. And in the hut, you have a candle and a fireplace. No electricity, no computers and word processors, no pencil, and no paper of any significant amount. 45, December 20th, I spent much of the day in writing, but was enabled to intermix prayer with my studies. January 7, 44, spent this day in seriousness with steadfast resolutions for God and a life of mortification, studied closely till I felt my bodily strength fail. December 20th, 42, spent this day in prayer and reading and writing and enjoyed some assistance, especially in correcting some thoughts on a certain subject. He was constantly writing. Now, one of the reasons this is significant is because we don't know what he wrote. Only the diaries and the journal are preserved of Brainerd. There, isn't any, there aren't any other manuscripts except letters. We, and yet he was constantly writing theological things. And we don't have any of them. He was writing for himself, just like you all should do. Publishing is not as significant as writing. You should all write because you clarify things when you write. You go deeper when you write. You get order when you write. You grow in facility with language when you write. He said, was most of the day employed in writing on a divine subject, was frequent in prayer. Another time, spent most of the time in writing on a sweet, divine subject. That's what we just don't have any of. Another time, was engaged in writing again almost the whole day. Again, rose early in the morning by candlelight some considerable time spent most of the day and wrote. Another time, towards night enjoyed some of the clearest thoughts on a divine subject that ever I remember to have had upon any subject whatsoever and spent two or three hours writing them. Now here's a man with absolutely none of your benefits, none of your comforts, none of your advantages, spitting blood every day, 
agonizing in his breath, not adequate food, Indians clamoring for his attention, totally alone, writing, 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 not for publication. And I commend it to you. Brainerd's life is one long agonizing strain to redeem the time, not grow weary in well-doing, and abound in the work of the Lord. Well, let me close with the last section, the effect of his life. The effect of his life. And I want to begin this little section with his effect on Edwards. We, we know Brainerd because of the impact he had on Jonathan Edwards. Had Edwards not been so moved, we would not know David Brainerd. Here's what Edwards wrote. I would conclude my observations on the merciful circumstances of Mr. Day- Brainerd's death by acknowledging with thankfulness the gracious dispensation of providence to me and to my family in so ordering that he should be cast hither to my house in his last sickness and should die here, so that we had the opportunity for much acquaintance and conversation with him and to show him kindness in such circumstances and to see his dying behavior, to hear his dying speeches and to receive his dying counsels and have the benefit of his dying prayers. Now what gives that incredible poignancy is that Edwards knew Jerusha caught the disease and died four months later. So that he was writing this a couple of years later, knowing that it had cost him the life of his daughter to have Brainerd in his house, and thanking God for the ministry. There's this beautiful description of of his taking each of uh, Edward's children aside and asking them about their faith and praying with them. And you can imagine how a father would see one of the most noble missionaries of the day doing that to his children and would would be deeply grateful, deeply thankful. Well, as a result of this immense impact on Edwards, uh, he wrote The Life of Brainerd. It's been reprinted more than all of his other books and has had an immense, immense impact. And I listed all the missionaries that I could think of who had read and commented on Brainerd earlier in the talk. But if that's true, that is, if you can assemble about a dozen famous missionaries who said they owe so much to Brainerd, how many countless unknowns must there be who fed on and were strengthened by this book? I mentioned colleges. Let me just refer to this briefly. Princeton and Dartmouth in some measure, owe their existence to David Brainerd, the frustrated pastor-scholar. It goes like this. He was kicked out of Yale. Jonathan Dickinson and Aaron Burr were, were getting fed up with Yale College. They were behind the awakening. They took Brainerd's side, tried to get him readmitted, and couldn't. The Synod of New York and New Jersey had it up to here with the carnality of Yale and said, when it happened to Brainerd, we're going to start our own school, namely the College of New Jersey, which became Princeton. And the, the beautiful little touch of providential, what do you call it, irony, is that in October of 46, Princeton was chartered by the uh, presbytery there in New Jersey. And in May of 47, now picture this, he is uh, four or five months before he's dead. He is at the house of Jonathan Dickinson for four months trying to recover to get back to Cross Weeks and to continue his ministry and then giving up finally and realizing he's too sick. During that time, Jonathan Dickinson, where he's staying, is appointed the first president of Princeton The classes begin in his house, and David Brainerd is called the first student of the College of New Jersey. And numerous scholars write about the indirect 
inspiration and impact that his expulsion from Yale and his passion for the ministry and for thinking had on the founding of Princeton College. There's another interesting story about uh, Eliezer Wheelock. Brainerd went to work among the Indians on uh, Delaware River at the Forks of the Delaware, in, uh, the Susquehanna Indians. And uh, he felt like a total failure. He worked there a year, gathered a few believers who later, by the way, went on to cross Weeksen and joined the community there, but left feeling a failure. However, his journal about his time there was read by Eliezer Wheelock, a friend of his, who was absolutely enthralled with the prospect of working among the, the Indians there, the Iroquois in particular. And so he took up the challenge among the Iroquois, then moved to Connecticut, pressed on, formed a school, and started a college which became Dartmouth College, owing in a very uh, remarkable way, a significant way, to the inspiration of the journal and model of David Brainerd. In 1740, Yale, Harvard, and William and Mary were the only colleges in the colony. And they were not sympathetic to the awakening. None of them was. But in the tide of the awakening came with the Presbyterians, Princeton, with the Baptist Brown University, with the Dutch Reformed, Rutgers, <coughs> and with the Congregationalist, Dartmouth, to show the educational spinoff of the Great Awakening, and isn't it remarkable that this nobody who served for four years in the wilderness was a key element in the founding of half of those schools, two out of the four? The lesson is that had he abandoned his missionary career, the writing of his journals and suffering, in order to take up a peaceful, settled, scholarly, pastoral life, the schools may not have been founded. We've never heard of him. The missionary movement would not have had that impulse. It is an amazing thing. I close with uh, two last comments. The most awesome effect of David Brainerd's ministry is the same as yours. There were about 150 Indians who will be in heaven because of his direct preaching ministry. I can't begin to estimate how many millions of people from all the tribes and tongues who will be because missionaries went under the inspiration. But let's just, let's just take his life as it stood. He had gathered about 130 souls of whom he was fairly sure of their conversion by the time he left. And it went on growing under the ministry of his brother John and I think Sinclair Ferguson has made plain to us the inestimable value of one soul plucked from everlasting destruction and brought into the eternal joy of God. Had he suffered what he suffered for only one Indian, that would still be his greatest achievement. And if he has 130 or 40 or 50 then all the more amazing. It might be fitting for me to close by opening up a, a journal that is far weaker and far more worldly. This is uh, from a journal entry of mine, June 28, 1986. Tom and Julie, you remember that day? You don't, you don't keep a journal, Tom. Maybe you do. June 28, 1986. This afternoon, Tom and Julie and I drove to Northampton. We found the gravestone of David Brainerd a dark stone slab the size of a grave top and a smaller white marble insert which said, Sacred 
to the memory of Reverend David Brainerd, a faithful and laborious missionary to the Stockbridge, Delaware, and Susquehanna tribes of Indians, who died in this town October 10, 1747, which is a mistake. Tom and Julie and Ruth and Hannah and I took hands and stood around the grave and prayed to thank God for Brainerd and Jonathan Edwards and to dedicate ourselves to their work and their God. It was a memorable and, I hope, powerful and lasting moment. Father, my heart is thankful to you 250 years later for this man, broken, sick, tormented, lonely, beat down, frustrated, glorious man. And I thank you for what you've taught me, what you've worked in me. And I long so much for us all now to be faithful. Father, give us some measure of his good spirit. and Oh, that we may not loiter on our heavenly journey. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got 20 minutes, I think, for for us to reflect on, on Brainerd's life. It's a very prejudiced account that you've heard here. Unashamed admiration. What would you like to talk about? Anything at all would be fine with me. Corrections or additions or queries? Go ahead, Bear. I haven't read one other book about Brainerd. All I've read is this. The Yale Critical Edition of uh, the diary and the journals and all of Norman Pettit's introduction and Brainerd's, I mean, uh, Edward's comments. So my exposure is very, very, very limited. It's not, uh, it's not based on the secondary literature at all. And I commend that approach to life to you. Forget secondary literature and go to the sources. I am so glad that I did not read Norman Pettit's introduction before I read Brainerd because I got so angry at the way he talked about brain. I was angry at him. He talked about joylessness again and again. And I underlined 50 places where he talked about joy. This unbelieving literary critic from the University of Chicago handling pearls that he knows nothing about. So don't go to secondary literature. Go to the sources. Uh, no, no offense, Bear. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. I'm glad. I didn't think you would be. Go ahead. So did Henry Martin, that lovely man. Chris. If I were a homiletics teacher, I would require that my students try every kind of delivery including the full manuscript, but in no way would I suggest that as the norm. I have read enough of history to know that God could take Thomas Chalmers, who read laboriously and transform a people, 
and God could take a Spurgeon who could prepare in 45 minutes and deliver an unforgettable message with a half sheet of notes, you must find your own way. I write out every Sunday morning sermon for 10 years because um, I think I have a gift for delivering it without people knowing that. All right? Not everybody does. And anybody that looks like they're reading should get rid of their manuscript. All right? But I do because I can't get my thoughts straight any other way. I can't get them straight. I can't get my ideas in order. You, you have to write if you have a weak mind. I believe this with all my heart because I went one time and talked to the faculty at Fuller Seminary in 1978. And I remember Ralph Martin, a New Testament teacher, in a kind of demeaning way, said, Oh, do you do that arcing stuff that Dr. Fuller teaches? Isn't that just a crutch? This is an exegetical device that requires writing out the text. Isn't that just a crutch? And I said, That's exactly what it is because I'm a cripple intellectual. So, unless you are like Jonathan Edwards and Albert Einstein and Carl Sagan or whoever and, and can take an idea and for an hour or two hold it and turn it like Dr. Ferguson said, I agree with him. That is not the prerogative of the genius. But I have to do it on paper. I cannot do it. I think of the shutters banging and the cars going by and food and... My mind won't hold an idea without a pencil in my hand. So, know thyself, brother, and <coughs> proceed. Go ahead, go back. I don't, but I'll tell you who can tell you. Mark Knoll has just written a history of, of Princeton, and you can, you can find... I'm sure, a very profound treatment of that move. I, it's a troubling phenomenon, I agree, Tom, to see what happens, what, what seems to always happen with my own alma mater. I fear, I don't know what might happen in there, but uh, it's a tragic thing, which is why I suppose there has to be constantly new schools being created, like there is in Florida now. Two of them, right there. Um, I don't know where the hands are coming first. Let's just start here. Go ahead, David. No, it, I was looking behind you, but go ahead. We'll jump back. In. My only exposure to John is the little I read in the introduction here by Pettit, who says that John took over the work in Cross Weekson, pressed on till he was 60 years old, that the work prospered, uh, and... Uh, that's it. I mean, so I, I just don't know what else to say. John, he had two favorite brothers, John and and uh, the other younger one, Israel. Maybe I'm not sure what his name was, but they both were evidently very uh, warm and successful ministers. The people. The people in his own day did not regard Brainerd as a weird, sick guy. We, we, when we read these kinds of personal testimonies and the self-deprecation, we Americans, from our psychological perspective, immediately indict him with sickness. They didn't. And it may not have been as sick as it looks to us. We have been told to esteem ourselves so consistently for so many years that anything that looks like the lack of self-esteem looks sick. Now, I suspect there was a measure of sickness in Brainerd, but not as much as the average reader today would think. Probably not. David, Lindy? Uh, Oh, there's so many things he has to teach us.
community. Oh, he just cried out for Christian community. He loved friends. He loved to talk with people. If there'd only been somebody with him to say, come on, David, quit it. It didn't go that bad yesterday. You have a very bad perspective. It was good. They listened to you. Somebody to give. We, do not, we, we are not made to function alone in the ministry. We will not judge our ministries correctly if we're left alone. We will either be excessively proud or excessively despairing. We must get the orientation of friends. So there's a, a first thing to learn, partnership and community in the ministry to give us balance. And Oh, my goodness, that's so important. The, a second thing is we must learn to use... No, that's not the right way to say it. We, we must learn to perceive our successes as the works of grace and delight in them. Delight in them. So that, and he does that periodically. He's just very, very hesitant, I think, to say anything that would come close to looking like he is extolling himself. And uh, we must find language that can say, it was a wonderful service yesterday. The Lord blessed. I felt freedom. I thanked the Lord for his goodness to me as a minister. I'm not perfect. I made mistakes, but it could have been a lot worse. So... Uh, Find, find language that can extol the mercy of God in our lives when he does one little fraction of kindness in us and through us. That's my alternative to self-esteem. Grace esteem, I like to call it. Cultivating the esteem of grace in all of its little dimensions in our lives. That's, that's my counseling approach. If, if somebody thinks they're too useless to go on in life, I don't generally try to find some feature in which they can boast, but I can point out so many evidences of grace in their lives, that God is at work in their lives, and, and he's the kind of God who really doesn't need much to work with. Witness David Brainerd in order to get on with them. So that's, a, that's an approach that I think he would point us toward. I think the biggest lesson he has for us along those lines is God-centeredness, an utter, absolute passion to keep God at the center of everything. Now, the danger of that is that people, some Puritan types, uh, don't uh, have the theological sophistication or depth to learn how to value the creation for God's sake. They feel that any delight in things is idolatry. And in my book, Desiring God, I wrestled with that in the chapter on prayer as, as well as I know how to wrestle with it and got my answer from Augustine who prayed, Father, he loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee which he loves not for thy sake. Now what that does is free you to obey Second Timothy or First Timothy 4 where all these things were freely given to you to enjoy. Marriage bed and food is the specifics in view. Sex and eating are not to be demeaned. And so when I say God-centeredness, what I mean is not that all you think about is God, but that you think of all in relation to God. Food, sex, children, shoes, health, sunshine, broken clutches, and everything else. Everything relates to God. And what I just cry for in my people is that they would be just God besotted. I love that phrase that Mark Knoll used in describing Jonathan Edwards. He was a God besotted person. And he touched a big God. Those are two or three things that come to my mind. Hmm.
story. All the historical implications of faithfulness in prayer. Who knows what will come in a hundred years? That was Tom's point with Ken Naw, the Burma fellow. Another three or four minutes here. Go ahead, Tom. We have not bothered to compile a list of biographies, but a good... What? Go ahead, Tom. For each one. Can I make a... That, that's exactly what I would have said. So that's, that's the first thing to say. And th- my second thing to say is this. Uh, most contemporary biographies are very thin. They are excessively atheological. You read Mary Drury on William Carey, you can't find a thing about his theology hardly. You don't know what drove the man. Contemporary biographies you don't give a rip about what drove the early missionary. And that's all I care about. So, uh, you know what you do? You go to the library and uh, you, you get these old, tattered versions that have no more copyright laws on them anymore and you photocopy them. See, they're not available. And you say, now, what would you pay for this in a, in a used rare bookstore? $60, $40, dollars for one of these old gems like the, the uh, journal of Henry Martin? You can't get that. But you can photocopy it for $15 or cheaper, depending on where you get your machine. So if I were you, I would pick out the people you want to read and then go back and find their journals and their diaries and their letters and copy them out of the library on paper. Bind them yourself with a loose-leaf binder and read a few each day. Or if you can find a classic biography that is theologically astute, then spend your time on that, but there's just a lot of stuff that's so thin today. You've got more important things to do with your time. It's not just age. It's the original is what I'm aiming at mainly. That's good. Very good point. Great. 